Can we get what we want by helping other people get what they want? That's what we'll talk about today. No one is useless in this world who lightens the burdens of another. Charles Dickens. Today, we're going to talk about the book, What's In It For Them? Nine Genius Networking Principles to Get What You Want by Helping Others Get What They Want by Joe Polish. One of the things that strikes me as interesting is when you look at people, I don't know, complain about life. I look a lot at different types of places where people complain about their lives. This person's wrecking my life. This group of people's ruining my life. I want those people to retire and let me be the boss of everything. And people look at other people as obstacles. And even when you work at an entry level job, we look at other people as the person who made me go out in the snow, the person who makes me go out to work, that annoying person who keeps asking me questions. It gets overwhelming. And instead of looking at life like this, what if we looked at life in a different way and understood, as this book says, what's in it for them? And by finding out what's in it for them, it will help us figure out what's going on with us too. This is not meant in the way of, I'm going to help other people so I can coerce them or entice them to do the thing I want them to do. This is about win-win situations. If you're in a starter job, if you're the head of a corporation, this book applies to you too. And that's what I thought was really intriguing by it. What's funny about it is I was looking, as I was starting to record this podcast, I googled what's in it to find the book so I could read you the title of it. And I found all the entries of what's in it for me. When am I going to get my thing? And this book didn't even come up on the first page of things until I started typing more. Everybody is interested in what's in it for me. But this book is asking us to look at things a little bit different. He says that the 30,000 foot view of his book is, it's a secret to success in life and business by learning how to connect, form relationships with other people and most people don't even know how to do that. That's his direct quote of what, what this book's about. He calls it networking. <laughs> Sometimes I always get caught up in a book when they call something something. Like when I did the book about selfish dating. It wasn't about being selfish. It was about making sure your needs are met too. And here too, I don't like the word networking. And he even says that everyone says they hate networking. And he's trying to sell it as a better method for us all. But he means it, I think, in a little bit different way. So he has two frameworks um, for his networking relationships. One is called ELF, easy, lucrative, and fun. Something that just fits right there. And then any relationship that is what is, quote, half, hard, annoying, lame, and frustrating, that's the wrong one. And so he's trying to help you to get away from that. This book is about connecting to other people. And in the process of helping them, they're helping you too. And how does this help get what you want? You'll be better at your job. You'll be better at your relationships. That always makes everything better. But then the people you're helping, you're making their lives better. They're going to start to make your life better too. Part of the reason I got this job is because I tried to feel other people's pains. I tried to understand what is in it for them when using the software and trying to help them this way. So in the end, the whole reason I got the job was because I followed this life plan. When you do the thing you're great at, other people will help you in doing the things they're great at. You can't expect it. You don't have to demand it. And sometimes you may be disappointed. But overall in life, if each one of us does the thing we're great at, the thing that we can help other people at, they'll start helping us too. When I read this book, I felt I should write this book because it has a lot of the philosophies I have when it comes to how you treat other people. And even in my own career in software, when I worked for my software company, I felt the pain of people because a lot of times when you get into the tech world and when I was a supervisor at a different company, people were jerks to people. Oh, well, they should know how to set up a network. And I'm sitting there thinking, who knows how to set up a network? That is a special trait. Back in that day, it was harder to do, but he knew how to do it. So he expected everyone else knew how to do it too. So one day he comes to me and says, hey, Jill, will you help me fill out this form of insurance? And I'm like, what? You don't know how to fill out an insurance form? And I was just kidding. Of course, I was going to help him. 
but he understood the point that something a lot of people know how to do, fill out insurance forms, is something he didn't know how to do. And yet something when he is technical and he knows how to do computer stuff, there's people who don't know anything about that. And he should have that same level of compassion to other people that he was hoping to get from me, although I was being a little bit of a jerk about it, because people don't know everything. And when we help each other, when he helps a customer who doesn't know how to do something on their computer, and I help my team because they don't know how to fill out a specific form, we all do better. We all get through it faster. We all learn something new and we all become better for it. I'm a better supervisor. He's a better support person. And the person on the phone call trying to get help is doing the fun thing they wanted to do. In this particular case, this was an awesome mom who wanted to figure out how to set up a network so her kids can play games together on the network. Back in that time, super hard to do. But it was a neat thing for a mom wanting to help her kids have fun over Christmas. So that's really where we're getting at with this book. And that's why this book resonated with me, because I believe it has helped me through my time in the technical career. It helped me in my time in my last company. And it's helping me now, too, in my new job. I'm going to try to help people by figuring out what's in it for them, not what's in it for me. So he said that the real way we get to people and we connect with people is to make their lives better. We become valuable or important to other people when they know they can come to us and ask the question. So let's say that that last employee I was talking about and I were in a company and you see both of us sitting at our desks and you have a question. Who are you going to come to? Probably going to come to me. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, Jill, that means you're going to do more work than he is because he's a jerk. Nobody wants to go to him. Yep. But when it comes time, For people to say, we have an important project. We need something to get done. We need someone who understands the end user. You're going to come to me about that too. So in the end, it does benefit me. It gives me high profile projects at work. It puts me in mind when there are promotions. And when it comes time, we were starting a brand new team and they needed someone who could be independent. They picked me. In fact, they picked me to go to Hawaii to do the implementation because they needed someone who was independent and didn't need a lot of help. Those high-profile projects helped me in my career. I just warn you, though, don't go into relationships thinking, what's in it for me? As soon as you do that, now you're trying to make some sort of a payment system. I'm going to be nice to you, but I expect you to be nice to me someday. You know, it's a little mobster-ish there. And that's what he's saying. By us reducing other people's suffering, we're going to make their lives better, we're going to start to collaborate, and that relationship forms in a certain way. The first thing you have to do is identify what is actually causing them to suffer. If you have customers, maybe you're like me and you work for a software company, why are they buying your software? They buy your software to solve a particular problem. So the company buying your software has a problem. What problem is it? The second part of it is the individual users you are trying to help what's their problem? And then the middle stage is there's a level of probably IT people in the middle who are trying to help their end users use the software successfully. That was always my big focus. We're the coordinators who were trying to be that middle level and getting kind of stuck between me, the software company, and them, their users. I tried to make their pain go away. They're in a tough spot because they Get people who are cranky about the software, don't want to use the software, and other people who are excited to use the software, but maybe we can't roll it out fast enough for them. This is a person who's stuck, so they always became my focus. I learned by going to conferences, asking them questions, what's their pain? So once we figure out exactly how other people are suffering, he said that's our opportunity to connect with them. And he says that we need to be, quote, a pain detective. That means we're going to investigate. We're going to be curious. We're going to ask people questions about what's genuinely causing them to suffer. And, you know, my grand scheme of things, not suffering, but their job is hard or their users are unhappy or this is going wrong or that's going wrong or this report's not working correctly. What can we do by being curious to figure out what's going on with them so that we can make their lives better? He gives a quote from a friend who came up with a term called atmospheric conditions. That means that when you understand 
the conditions of someone's life, that's what they're going through, what they have to deal with, you'll understand better why they behave the way they do. And so when someone comes to you on a support call, or like the woman who called trying to get her network set up, or the people I work with who are coordinators trying to make the software work for their organization, what is it they're struggling with? What is it they're having problems with? And they're just a human being. They want to go home to their kids. They want to do a great job. They want to be able to be proud to their boss and be appreciated by their boss. They want their users to not be unhappy. And once you understand the complexity of it, you'll be more attuned to helping them. One of the problems comes in is that if you have a customer who is particularly annoying, yelling at you or maybe pestering you a lot, and you just say, oh my gosh, Bob calling again. There's a reason Bob's calling you all the time. And instead of being frustrated, be curious, ask questions and find out what is going on. Is there something you can do that would make this situation better? And when you dig hard and you come up with solutions, that person will See you as an authentic partner. Again, you're not doing this to get on their good side. You're doing this and then will become on their good side. You will engage in trying to solve their problems. And instead of uh, making a person feel used or like you're selling to them or you're trying to just get something out of them, you are genuinely helping them. And that is going to make all the difference in the world to helping this person. He says that communication is the real problem, that in any situation that we have, we're in a relationship and there's three directions he says we can go. We can communicate and talk together and figure something out. We can connect, which means that we're moving beyond communication and forming a bond, or we can escape. We want to get out of this situation for whatever reason. And so he says that you have to figure out, are the people that you're trying to connect with, are they pulling back, he says, or leaning in? Are they connecting with you or disconnecting with you? I always had the fortune because my company had a conference twice a year. And so when I would go to these conferences, I would see the people I work with on the phone all year long. And you know what? It was like a family reunion. We hugged, we talked about our pets and our kids and our horses and all the things that mattered to us. And sometimes I would see people on both sides of the scales, both the customer and the company side of things, standing in a corner by themselves, talking to their work friends. They talk to every day. Isn't that interesting? They talk to them every day. And now they're going half across the United States, going to an expensive conference. And instead of trying to figure out how you make people tick. They're standing with the people they stand with on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Such a lost opportunity. And then building that bond, because when that person knows you, gets to understand you, and you come back to the and say, hey, dude, I'm sorry, I cannot get this to work. Our developer said that it just isn't going to work that way. We can't make a table. They believe you. They understand you because they know you. They know the kind of person you are. If you make no attempt to get to know them, to understand them, to be a partner with them, they can't tell whether you're just saying something to get rid of them or you mean it sincerely. In this whole process of me getting my website moved to another domain, let me say that I spent three months on product support and one month begging them to move my site. But they were dribbling out support. Hey, Jill, could you let us know what this setting is? Oh, sure. Yeah, it's this week later. Hey, Jill, could you turn this thing off? Oh, sure. Yeah. And I do it right away. Okay. It's turned off. They were dribbling out support to me and I couldn't get anything done. And I kept telling them, I have a podcast. It's really hard to schedule a podcast when I don't know when my website is going to get moved. I don't know when it's going to happen. And so their support left me with no trust of them because I knew they were, I mean, I've been in product support for a long time. I knew they were dribbling out support to me. And I didn't have any relationship with them because every time I talked to someone, I talked to someone brand new. So it wasn't like this was my support person I knew and understood, just some random person on a phone line to a company that wasn't helping me at all. Makes for a bad situation. But in this particular case, 
He says, if we understand the atmospheric conditions of the person, we will understand what is going on with them. And he gives this analogy, and it's kind of interesting, is that let's say that you had someone who had a nail in the side of their head, and that person was complaining about having headaches. And you would say, well, it's because you have a nail inside of your head. And someone might say, oh, you're not listening to me. You're just trying to figure out how to solve my problems. Yeah, but if you do have that relationship with someone, you can solve their problems. You can listen to what's going on with them and tell them, you know what, if you took that nail out of your head, you would feel a lot better. And that is the key is because now you understand where that pain is coming from and what's happening. And so he also gives the example of a coworker who's exhausted. Maybe their kid was up all night screaming, something like that. And they're just falling asleep at the job. So instead of yelling, instead of, why don't you just go home? You know, something like that. Oh, you know, I understand, you know, you had a rough night with your kid. Tell you what, you know, would you do better if you got a good night's sleep tonight and got to go home a little bit early and then you could be rested tomorrow? Oh, why don't you go do that? And then instead of it being a jerky reaction, you're understanding that person's situation and trying to find a method that would help them. So he said that when you understand the people, who they are, their atmospheric condition, what makes them tick, you will be able to then go in and help them in the most honest way possible. And he says that in the end, the issue is not trying to overthink the situation. It is just trying to connect. To give you an example, I had a situation where someone was trying to do a specific thing with the software. I tried to move heaven and earth to get the software to do that thing because they had a user who wanted to do this. I talked to developers. I talked to leadership. I talked to anyone I could. When in the end, after really getting into this whole situation, I found out that the issue was they felt like they had just said no to their users one too many times. And I said, would it help if I got on a meeting with your users and talked to them about it? Would you? Oh, absolutely. So I got on there and I sort of explained why we can't do this particular thing. We're not really capturing that data. It's not really how the data works in this particular case. And she, in the end, she wasn't trying to get me to move heaven and earth to help her. She was just trying to just not say no one more time. That was the real issue. So once I connected with her and I figured out what was really going on, that's what made that deep connection we had. And then he says, once you have that deep connection, that's when you're going to build what he says, trust, rapport, and comfort. People know you. They know that I went through the extra effort to try to make it happen. And when it didn't happen, I talked to the users and took responsibility for it. We also know too, he says that when we really know people and understand their pain and understand who they are or the atmospheric conditions, we know if we should joke if we should ask questions, if we should just apologize, or we should be honest and direct. Sometimes I do have a problem being honest, direct, because I do like to make people happy. And my friend is fantastic at it. It's why she's so good at what she does. She tells you the honest truth of things. But once you get that level of comfort with people, you will know exactly, is this someone I can just say, look, in the end, this is never going to happen. It's not the way the data is stored at all. Or I can put in an enhancement request for the software and we'll see what we can do in the future. But today or anytime soon, not going to happen. He says, too, that once we understand people and we learn to be this pain detective, we'll know when we should connect, but we'll also learn when we should disconnect. He says that some people are takers, leeches, and energetic vampires suck the life right out of you. There are people out there who just want to make other people's lives miserable. And there's no amount of talking to, comforting, making a joke, finding out answers that will make them happy. They just want to end you. And I've been in that situation too when I worked on support for Microsoft and when I worked in the software companies that I worked for in my past three jobs. You can tell there are people who just want to destroy. And he says that once we do that a curiosity, We'll understand exactly who that person is and whether or not they're just trying to punch our numbers. My dad, it turned out after a while, I figured out he was that mm, energetic vampire or maybe happiness vampire. He was fine most of the time, but when he drank, 
He just wanted to put you down. It didn't matter what he said or what you did or what you tried to do. He was just, I'm miserable. I'm going to make you miserable too. When you learn that about someone, now you know how to act. And he says, and then you can know when to ask questions or when to just give up. He says, we shouldn't be afraid of our own shortcomings. It makes us more vulnerable to the people who are not vampires. We should pay attention to our body language. I'll be honest with you. I have, you know, people talk about resting face. I won't even go into the word. I have resting thinking face where I'm just thinking. I'm running through scenarios in my brain. And sometimes it may look like I'm not paying attention. And I have to focus on that. Remember to smile and look people in the eye and maybe think later, write something down and think about it later. So we can read the room. He says, sometimes we might want to ask people for a small favor earlier on. Could you do me a favor? Could you please ask your user to get me some screenshots? I know they're kind of cranky about this and this is a big ask because you're going to have to go to their desk or you're going to have to talk to them. But a screenshot would mean a million sentences that we could get done with and I can show that picture to the developer. You know, and that way, once we build all these rapport, once we build that connection with people, then, you know, things start falling into place with ourselves. But he also says that we have to worry about being inauthentic. And this is where I was saying earlier, if you are just using people, if you are just trying to get your way by using your magic, powerful customer service skills on people, that is one dangerous because people are going to figure it out at some point. Boy, you can smell a person who is not genuine a mile away. You might not think it if you're not a genuine person, but believe me, people can see it. They can tell exactly what's going on when they're, when they're being played, when they're telling you a pity story just because they want you to go away. You can actually really tell that. So don't just be positive, kind in order to get something back. You want to do it because you're actually trying to solve their pain. And once you're a genuine human being, you'll be able to connect with them better. And again, also asking questions and connecting people, sometimes you're going to get that negative energy and you're going to see they're the wrong kind of people to connect with. And he mentions questions. There's all sorts of different like question websites out there, but good questions to ask people, you know, just even like when I'm at my conference. Half the time I'm asking people like, what were their favorite vacations? Or what did they do this summer that was really exciting? Or where do they hope to go this coming year? You can find out more about people and you find out a little bit too about what makes them tick. You know, if you say, well, where do you plan on going vacation this year? Oh, I'm going to take my kids and we're going to go camping and we got these tents. And now, you know, they're pretty rugged. They like to do rustic things. Or they say, you know what? I just have this brand new friend. We're going to go to the Caribbean and we're going to go sailing. And now, now you know something else about those, that person too. So one of the genuine ways that you can meet people and connect with people is asking them questions that have nothing to do with your job or anything about this particular topic. But he wants you to think about your genius network, which means who are the people in your inner core and what makes them tick? All right, so we're going to call it there and we'll talk more about this next week. We're going to talk about now that we have this idea of what a connection works, what are some ways that we can do to make those connections stronger? So my challenge to you is try to come up with a list of the eight closest people to you and write down just a few things that make them tick. What is it that excites them? What is it that makes them happy? What kind of goals do they have in the future? What are things that you could help them to meet those goals? Is there something that you could do to make their pain go away, be their pain detectors, and make that true connection that allows you to see what's in it for them? All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening. All my podcasts are now moved over to the new site, and that allowed me to do more things. If you're wondering what other podcasts we have, you can check out a abetterlifeinsmallsteps.com. It's going to be a blog and the main network site. My friend is joining me on this endeavor by writing for the blog. And we want to hear from you. We want to know what's in it for you and what you would like to hear or see in a blog. Happy to answer questions, talk about a topic you like, anything you want. And remember, our method of creating connections with other people starts with small steps. 